Welcome to another episode of The Empire's New Clothes. We have a special guest today, Martin Wolf. He's the chief economic commentator at the Financial Times. Uh, 1971, began his career at the World Bank, but a decade later became director of studies at the Trade Policy Research Center. And recently, fairly recently, in 2000, was awarded the commander of the British Empire for services to financial journalism. And so, Martin, welcome. Pleasure. And so, before we dive in, I, I do have to ask, what is the commander of the British Empire? It sounds quite regal. <laughs> could, could you elaborate a little bit? It's actually not at all that regal. When I am introduced in um, the United States in particular, uh, and people note with amusement this title, I tend to say that it shows that whatever else the British have lost, they haven't yet lost their sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> since I then go on to say, it is clear the British will go on um, giving this award in the, and a, a number of other awards in honor of the British Empire long after everybody has forgotten that there ever was a British Empire, um, since this is now a long time ago. The historical origin is slightly strange. Um, hmm. There always were in Britain and in many other countries honors for military people uh, and uh, uh, and for people who served the sovereign, but not for anybody else. And then in um, the First World War, which was the first war of, of total mobili mobilization of our mm -hmm. society and indeed of Western society broadly. But in this case, many civilians were actively engaged in activities relevant to the war. Of course, many died as a result, though nothing like as much as in the Second World War with the bombings. And so the, it seems that the royal household, I don't know whether it actually came with the kings, decided there should be an honor that went to civilians. And so they invented something called the Order of the British Empire. At that stage, this was more than 100 years ago, there still was a British Empire. And they started out giving a number of awards and there were the whole ranks of it from the, the Knight Commander of the British Empire, then the Commander, which is me, then the, the OB and the MB, we won't go through all those. And I think uh, the, the CB is a moder moderately distinguished uh, award. I think at any time there are about eight or nine thousand of us, so it's hardly very rare. But it is considered um, something of an achievement, if if also quite ludicrous. <laughs> well, t to me, it sounds more like an achievement. I mean, you've clearly spent so many of your years thinking and processing and sharing your thoughts and um, analysis of. Uh, the finance, financial markets and uh, geopolitics, and so you know, I didn't even I didn't even think about that, but that's quite a nice little segue of you mentioning um, the UK, Britain. It was an empire, and now it's Indeed. not. And Indeed, so, it was the last one before know, America. Yes, exactly. And you know, looking at it, that's actually quite a nice transition for an empire to hand the reins of empire to. A fellow co-patriot, as it were, instead of say um, a rising power that could be seen as um, quite competing um, goals and motives as the dominant empire, which we perhaps see now coming up in the world. And so, looking back in history, we do see a somewhat cyclicality nature to empire. And so, I, I think it's quite fascinating. Of course, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to study the American empire in the greater context of the cyclical nature of history. And so, so many folks in America seem to really just cognitively avoid the idea that America has any sense of declining. And so maybe to kind of start, we'll, we'll build a little case here of what is a first off? What is a necessary engine to have a strong democracy? And and in some of your readings, I, I've um, read a lot of your opinions about having a strong middle class is extremely important for a healthy democracy. Do you mind um, opening that up a little bit for us? Yes, um, 
just may have, before I get there, let me just comment yeah. very briefly because I think you've raised a fascinating issue. When Britain was a world empire, which really goes from the 18th to the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. it wasn't in fact a democracy. In fact, in, in a complete sense, throughout that period until the, I mean, you could say that Britain became a universal suffrage democracy of an egalitarian kind in 1930, when all women had the same vote as men. Prior to that, there was always limited franchises, and of course, for much of its history, very limited, as was true, of course, of America too in the 19th century. And uh, uh, so the more democratic Britain became, which was the late 19th and above all the 20th century, the less imperial it became. The, the, hmm. There was a very obvious early, a sort of tension because the people increasingly expected the British government to look after itself and themselves rather than get involved in the world, as it were, except when the world came to them, as it did, of course, in the First and Second World War so dramatically. The second point I wanted to make, because that's a that's exceptional. The United States is one of the very few countries placed in history trying to run an empire or being an, That's a very good an point. imperial power while being a democracy. Um, the obvious predecessors are strangely Athens and Rome. We'll come to that in a, in a, um, a moment. The second point you made is a very subtle one and I think important. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly in the 19th century, many leading British people sort of thought America is going to be our enemy. We actually fought, of course, a war with America, and that's in 1812. Uh, it's quite a long time ago. But during the Civil War, American Civil War, there are quite a few British people who thought this is our opportunity to break up mm. America. We should ally ourselves with the South. And lots of mm. Republicans thought that. And if the British had aligned themselves with the South and given them their naval power, which was then dominant, it could almost certainly would have affected the outcome. But in the end, the British concluded they couldn't side with the slaveholders. That's interesting. That was mostly because of working class and middle class views, which were then fiercely abolitionist in Britain. And so that moment passed in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The British found two things were happening. One, as you rightly say, America seemed more like them than the other rival powers. You know, same language, same sort of history, similar origin at that ca ca time. Uh, um, the the non-African-American um, population was pr predominantly still of European extraction. Um, but they also found that, and this is relevant here, um, that they had two enemies, as it were, potential enemies. There was the far enemy, the United States, you know, the, the, the potential world-beating rival, and there was the near enemy, Germany. And effectively, they felt, we've got a choice here. I mean, I'm putting it too neatly. But effectively, we either fight Germany aligned with uh, America or it goes the other way around. And then they found it very, very clear Germany was the greater threat. So this being the case, and Japan, of course, to a lesser degree. So in this case, as you say, the British aligned themselves and allied themselves to the Americans in the First World War, and that was decisive, never changed. And so America had no real opposition from Britain. Um, this is very different from the situation now, when the rival is, of course, um, so wildly different from America. There is no other rival comparable. So it looks much more like a straight two-way uh, two um, conflict. Now, the difficulty the Americans have always had, well, difficulty, I think it's actually a good thing, but this is a huge continental power, unlike Britain, and indeed, unlike all the previous European imperial powers. Uh, most of its development, resources, wealth has always derived from internal development, though the world economy has become more important over time. It's still, it still doesn't trade that much, for instance, compared with Britain, uh, which is very, very much more open, more vulnerable. And the Brit it's, it has been now for a longish time uh, uh, a sort of democratic republic, rather peculiar one, uh, constitutionally. And so the first priority of American politicians has always been 
um, the domestic front. At the same time, America has become the dominant global power um, ever since the Second World War, I would say ever since the First World War, though the interwar period was a mess. Um, and they've had to balance those two things. Uh, and that's involved a lot of, that is, I think, created a lot of tension and a lot of conflict internal and uh, above all internal about that relationship between the democratic republic and its obligations and its world power. And the British had this much less because their domestic base was so much smaller and the world as a whole was so much bigger and the empire was so much more important part of their direct part of their economy than it was for America. So the precedent is there, but it's somewhat, dis it's a bit dissimilar. The stuff you brought up is so fascinating. And as you kind of say, the US is a bit different because its focus has been so much domestic with the protecting that constitution as it were and those that vision of democracy yet also being this massive dominant empire do do you think a reserve currency and so Tr triffin's dilemma that if you have the reserve currency you you need to be exporting dollars to pr provide dollars for the world and yet that causes serious negative impacts domestically eventually it's quite it's quite a slow process so do you think triffin's dilemma is perhaps forcing that hand of the u.s has for so long been able to balance these two and be a little more empire a little more domestic but it it's been able to do both do you see perhaps we're getting to a period where it's going to have to choose to take care of itself or maintain that empire is 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 a is a point of change coming this is a really, really complicated question at many levels. I was sort of thinking, do I have a, an hour to answer it? Obviously not. <laughs> uh, the, the, because I think one has to be very subtle. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to start off by trying to define what we mean by an empire and the role uh, a reserve currency plays in that. Um, because here we're now moving into quite modern conceptions um, or potentially quite modern conceptions. Obviously, the historic idea of an empire uh, and I think the relevant concept of empire in most contexts historically, and by this I mean prior to, say, 1900, could go back earlier, and this is a simplification, is a system in which you just directly controlled territory. You were the sovereign authority legally uh, and de facto um, in uh, territories which extended far, far beyond your original homeland. Um, so you know, that uh, the Chinese Empire was such an empire created over time and expanded by successive emperors. Um, the Roman Empire was similar. Um, I can go on for that. The British Empire was that sort of empire, though. But this is where I'm going to get to this dual side that, that Britain directly controlled, um, I think, about a quarter of the world population in places that it effectively ruled though in some places like india there was a lot of indirect rule but effectively it ruled these this place um but britain was also something else that is to say it was the first industrial power and so it was the technological leader and uh, which hadn't been necessary for previous empires. Rome was actually relatively backward when it conquered the, what we call the Middle East. Uh, um, it was just good at war. And it also created the world's leading financial markets and the world's dominant currency. So it was, in addition to being an empire, I'm not saying they were completely independent, but in addition to being an empire in the traditional sense, it was also an empire in a more modern sense 
Mm. One would have to say that too had precedents. You could say Venice, Florence, the Dutch Republic were also empires to some degree in that second modern commercial financial sense. But Britain really was the first to do this globally. So the pound was the dominant currency. The Bank of England was the dominant central bank. Britain was the largest import market in the world. And that was true for everybody. So to, to just, I think what I'm going to tell you is correct. That though Britain, of course, invested hugely in, in the empire, it was actually its biggest ex ex export of capital was to America, which wasn't part of its empire. Mm. Um, so Britain was two things. It was a imperial power in the classic sense, controlled territory, ruled these places, and it was the dominant commercial power and intellectual interest, influence across the world as well as the currency world. Then along comes America. What's interesting about America is that it didn't really have any of the former. It doesn't it had it, it ruled the Philippines for a while, didn't really matter. It never conquered and ruled uh, South America. Could have done. Nobody could have prevented. In truth, um, it never didn't conquer and rule uh, Europe and Japan. Could have done that. So it doesn't have an empire in this classic sense. It remained this continental power, with as we talked about earlier. But it fully and completely occupied this second modern sense of empire, which is the empire is the center of the world economy. And because it's the center of the world economy as a monetary system, as a trading system, in terms of the international institutions it created to regulate all this, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, it has involved a system of power which you can see very clearly originates out of or follows the mold of the British Empire in this respect, but is unique. So the American world system, which is what I th like to think of it as rather than as an empire, I think of the American world system, is a unique development. And that makes it difficult, I think, to be quite confident of how it ends. Uh, because there are many respects in which China isn't like that, and I think probably never will be. Uh, now, what role, you are asking, does the currency play in all that? In all that? And the, the answer, obviously, is quite a lot. Uh, it's not all of it. I mean, the fact that the Americans had the most potent military is obviously relevant. Um, the fact that America had the most innovative economy is clearly relevant. Uh, and the, the fact that American businesses have been so successful across the world is clearly relevant. We could go on. The fact that American universities play such an enormous role in the intellectual life and American culture. Um, don't underestimate the influence of Disney. I mean, th this is really a pervasive influence. And in this respect, as I said, it's a bit more like Brit it's like Britain, but even more so. Where is the currency fitted that? The currency obviously is a valuable asset. It allows America to exert a lot of leverage, as we've seen particularly in recent years through sanctions. So it's an instrument of power. There's no doubt about it. It allows the United States to finance itself more easily than any other country because you know people will hold dollars and people will and in colossal proportion of the world's dollars are held outside the United States because it's trusted and it's trusted because its con domestic constitution and order is seen as powerful and credible. Now, how big a weakness is this d willingness of foreigners to hold dollars? That's essentially the Triffin dilemma. I now think, um, though this could prove wrong tomorrow, as it were, that the Triffin dilemma is not as se severe as Robert Triffin thought. Hmm. Um, I started studying economics when he was writing, so this is right at the beginning of my um, uh, learning in economics. And I think of it in the following respects. Um, Triffin thought that there will be a limit that in order to satisfy the world's demand for dollars, the US would have to run um, trade deficits, current account deficits. That's how, and sooner or later, if it did that, the world would find 
its holdings of dollars, it was satiated. And they would start regarding the dollar as rather risky. And in the 1960s, this is roughly this period of writing, that seemed very plausible. Um, and what certainly turned out to be the case is that it's really hard to run a domestically oriented monetary policy designed to achieve full employment at home and to be the anchor currency of the world system in a fixed exchange rate system. And I think the Triffin dilemma really applies to a fixed exchange rate system mm -hmm. because at some point other wealth holders will say, we're not going to hold this stuff. And, and it led to, that's pretty clear. I think most economists would agree. That led to the breakdown of the system he was working, thinking about, the IMF-based Bretton Woods system, as it's called. In 1971, it disappeared. Now, since then, it's been really rather different. It's a floating rate system. The US clearly pursues a dominantly domestically oriented policy. Um, uh, most of the time, other countries hold the dollar you know, it floats against them more or less willingly or unwillingly. They don't want the United States to devalue too much against them because it creates competitiveness problems. And that means that they sort of more or less willingly buy dollars. So, uh, and the US always has the threat, well, if you don't like it, then we'll let the dollar collapse. We don't mind. Uh, uh, and most of the time they do, as we saw, have seen with China and many other countries. So it turns out that within some very large margin, and we don't know where the limits of this are, the US has, having got rid of the promise to turn dollars into gold, which was obviously unsustainable, and it's not a Triffin point, and also getting rid of the promise, uh, everybody else giving a giving up the promise that with America that they would try convert these currencies against each other at a fixed rates. The Americans basically have a lock on everybody else because they're not prepared to let the dollar collapse and therefore they're perfectly prepared to finance one way or other US deficits. And I used to think 15, 20 years ago, I wrote a book about this, that this was a point of immense vulnerability for the US. But so far, at least, it has turned out not to me because the rest of the world funds the U.S. deficits voluntarily. Can that end? Yes, of course it can. But to do that, people have to decide that there is some other liability, monetary liability, which is obviously better in all, of, in all relevant respects than the, than the dollar. And I've held the view and still hold the view that this form of empire, which is just a little bit of the American empire, but an important part of empire, is pretty soundly based because there isn't anything else that can defeat it. You know, the, the, in the last resort, you can't beat something with nothing, and the dollar has a, virtues which the euro doesn't have and the RMB doesn't have, um, and nothing else is likely to have, and Bitcoin for sure doesn't have, so my bet is unless they blow it up by massive inflation or some other irresponsibility, which is possible, possible, um, we're going to continue in the dollar era, possibly long after the U.S. is as, was as you know long after it's climacteric in terms of power. In the end, it took two world wars, shattering economic disruptions before the dollar, which was the closest thing you could possibly imagine to the pound, that's the point I'm stressing, the US is so much a continuation of the pound, mm -hmm. could replace the pound. There is no other place that can replace the US so, e so, so easily. So I know this is a very lengthy answer, but my view is the, the monetary financial dominance of the US is quite likely to last for a rather long time. And so in your view, you mentioned many other elements of American, the American version of empire, a, a yep. slightly more modernized uh, British version minus the imperial rule. Which of these elements do you see as perhaps more dangerous in a way that America might need to, might desire to hold on a certain of these elements. And I, and I recently started thinking about this, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, is that 
when I think about American exceptionalism, this idea of um, like almost divine flourishing, it's like destiny. <clears throat> um, in the beginning, that's actually quite a good thing for a group of people to have, this collective goal and vision that we're, we're special, we're strong, we're mighty, and we can create anything we want to within our country and perhaps abroad. There's, of course, some very negative implications with that kind of tribalism. But in the beginning, it's quite a strong identity and a rallying cry group people can gather behind. But then we turn the wheels of time forward. We're now at the later, perhaps later stages of an empire. And this idea of exceptionalism is almost an inability to see the actual vulnerabilities that you might possess as a nation and the inability to view other countries and say, you know what, they might be better at us than something and I can actually learn from others. And so I kind of encapsulate all those different things you mentioned as like uh, cultural innovation, education, all these great things that have come out of the American empire under this, the, under this blanket of the identity and this exceptionalism. Which of those elements you mentioned, or perhaps any of this, would you see as a greater threat to America right now? It's inability to accept fault, or some of these elements of empire that America might want to hold on to and fight for, to for completely futile purposes. Well, let me start by the, the good aspects of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that compared with other imperial powers, what I called, as it were, type one imperial powers and the Britain yes. somewhere in between. The American people are not attached to, rather the opposite, to the idea of running around the world and ruling people or even fighting wars. Uh, I mean, I, it seems to me rather interesting after a period of what I thought was pretty fair stupidity. Um, uh, the uh, w w there's very little that Barack Obama and Donald Trump had in common, but one thing they had in common is they really did thought it was a very bad idea to go out and fought, fight wars everywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, the the you know the U S has made some very very serious mistakes in war. The most obvious, I think, being the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. So the, they can do this and they can do it stupidly. But it doesn't seem to me to be a core part of their identity that they do what I think of as sort of standard imperial fighting on the remote frontiers. And of course, in our current world, the remote frontier could be everywhere. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, the I think the things that the Americans would find very difficult to live with, and in a way one can understand this, are the sense that they have lost economic and technological superiority. Their, their sense of themselves as the dominant power in what I call the American world system, not, uh, as I said, an empire, but um, that's because I tend to try and think of empire in, in, the, in my type one sense. But the American role in the world system has basically derived from the fact that since the late 19th century, it was the biggest economy in the world. It was uh, the most productive economy in the world in terms of simple measures of output per head, standard of living, of course, with all, it was far and away not the most unequal in the developed world, by the way, uh, at the beginning of that period, it was relatively egalitarian, relatively leaving aside, of course, the permanent problem of race, this deep problem of race. It was the technology leader, crucial, um, ever since what's called the second industrial revolution. So electricity, uh, the, you know, from electricity, the internal combustion engine, the chemical industry, and all the rest of it up through computing and so forth. The US was absolutely at the forefront of world technology. Uh, and that uh, for about half of that period, so we're going from 1870 to today, Germany was pretty close to being an equal. 
just in technology. But since the Second World War, the United States has really been on its own in terms of where the frontier of technology has been occurring. And that's, of course, been linked to just you just look at the Nobel Prizes to its overwhelming dominance of world scientific innovation. And I think those are what I've just described, the scale, and I haven't added, the world's biggest financial ma markets, the dominant currency, and the dominant players in those markets. Those are the core attributes of American power in the world uh, over this long period. And they're, and they're pre in a, the, our modern world, which is a world in which the economy is decisive in determining power and influence. It also determines the technological level of your military, all that. These are the decisive sources of power and influence in your ability to shake the world. And I think Americans have sort of taken for granted the idea that they're number one in all those respects. Over the last 80 years, there was a period, uh, um, 70 years, when Japan and Europe caught up to some considerable degree, and that rather upset Americans. I remember it very well in, in the 70s and 80s, even more, and 90s with Japan. But in the end, it turned out that uh, they caught up, sort of, but they never passed it. Uh, and it's pretty clear that in the relevant respects that we're talking about, America sustained its primacy very clearly against its European and Japanese allies. It didn't turn out to be a great problem. Uh, the Soviet Union, in all the respects which I've just listed, was always uh, not really a was never really a challenger. The only thing it was, it had an ideology which had been attractive at some point. And of course, it, it put any staggering proportion of its resources into its military and created a vast conventional army which seemed quite threatening. But the truth is the Soviet Union was at no point a serious rival to American power in the senses that I have just detailed uh, as an economic, technological, scientific, um, financial power. It was the center of the world throughout, uh, I would say, since uh, the big early 20th century, um, uh, but for various reasons, surprisingly, in fact, the Americans weren't prepared to play that role in the interwar period. It's, it is important to note the Americans were all dragged into becoming the dominant world power. In the 20s and 30s, they really tried quite hard to avoid it, and then they discovered, well, it didn't work that way. So it's they weren't really an enthusiastic imperial power, in my sense. Uh, the Manifest Destiny was mostly about taking over the whole continent and developing it. They were dragged into world power, but they got rather used to it the way people do if they get dragged into world mm -hmm. power. Now, of course, China is a different sort of rival. Um, it's immensely much bigger in population than this, the United States. It's the first time one of its rivals has had that characteristic. Its economy is arguably bigger than the US already. It's certainly about as big and it's getting bigger. Um, it still has lots of potential. It has caught up technologically to a significant degree, and uh, though it's still behind in certain important respects, it has an enormous and rapidly growing military. So it has nothing as a financial power. I don't think that's relevant yet. I think ideologically and intellectually, it's not very attractive to the world. So U.S. is still there, but clearly China is a different sort of threat, rival, uh, uh, and it's ideologically so very different. So I think the U.S. is moving into a different period of existence, and I think it's pretty clear that the U.S. hasn't worked out what it intends to do about that, except that it feels that it's been cheated or the American people feel they've been cheated into allowing China to become so big. Uh, and the question, to my mind, is will the U.S. Ne be prepared to adjust to this, or is it going to fight uh, cold or, God forbid, hot wars to prevent it? And that's, I think, in many ways, among the biggest questions of the next half century. You, you mentioned the American people feel cheated, in a sense, do you mind elaborating a little bit about that of perhaps some of these dynamics of there was this great promise of globalization and what it would do for everybody? 
but many folks at that point knew what it meant. It was capital on the prowl for cheap labor globally. But now, especially with hindsight, many people can um, perhaps be exposed to that view and accept it, that that's what globalization was and is, and how that has massively hollowed out the industrial base and the, um, the middle class engine of America in, in many respects, not all. Do you mind walking us through a little bit of those dynamics? Yeah, so um, I think that it would be fair to say that among economists, and I'm one of them, uh, um, the view, as it were, the history of the last 40 years would probably be slightly different. But I don't think it's, it's not entirely different. In the 80s and 90s, um, several things came together to create globalization. And the interesting thing about it is it was sort of push and pull. It's not, it wasn't an, a very important, it wasn't just, as it were, an American idea. Very far from it. Um, the uh, by the late 70s, um, really important people around the world had sort of come to the conclusion, you know, these, these Yanks were right. Uh, a more market-oriented economy, more liberal trade, uh, more private enterprise. This works. It seems to make countries richer. And we would like that. Um, so when I think about who was, the, who was the real father of modern globalization, I don't think of Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher. I think of Deng Xiaoping, uh, who hmm. basically concluded just this. China had to do what he and all his acolytes constantly referred to as reform and opening up. And this is what they meant. And remember, for those of us who remember what the Chinese economy was like in 1980, the transformation was sort of unbelievable. I mean, really unbelievable. Very similar ideas emerged in India, but a bit later, but very, very significant, very big changes in policy from one of the cl most closed economy in the world. And of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union was basically about this. I mean, the people of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, I visited in 1990 and talked to a lot of people, they basically concluded, you know, our system doesn't work. The Americans were right. Uh, their system works better. We want to join it. Um, and that was an immensely important driver. Similarly, the developing countries that got involved in tr trade liberalization in the Uruguay round, they were they were dragged in to some degree, but mostly quite voluntarily because people have persuaded them uh, and they persuaded themselves that the countries that have been inside the American system, the Europeans, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Taiwanese, um, they're the ones who've done really well, so we, they should join it. So in a way, what you think of as the disaster of globalization was uh, the the biggest part of it was that the rest of the world all decided this American system, this post-war sort of liberalizing system, which up to then had been mostly about Europe and East Asia because nobody else wanted to join. That's all. Um, they all said, we want to join. And they did. And the Americans at that stage said, well, that's very gratifying. Shows we won. We were right. Uh, they should join. Uh, and the world will be a better place because they're all going to become more like us, uh, you know, market oriented economies, uh, more liberal, more private sector, not like Maoism. It'll be something completely different. It'll be a better world. So I think it's very important to understand the, the immensely powerful drive that came from everywhere else in the world. So when I started working on trade policy, which was in the 70s, and I've worked for a long time on trade, I was in this paradoxical situation. The Western countries said, you should all liberalize and make your economy more market-oriented and efficient. All over the 
world, at the World Bank, I used to go around and say this, and they say, no, that's imperialism. That's neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism. We hate this idea. We're going to remain protectionist and inward-looking the way the Soviets are, and that's worked so well for them. And by 1990, that was, that was dead. So th I think this is one of the greatest stories in world history. I don't, but I'll give you one other thing. Uh, you know, the American was the dog that chased the car, and he caught the car. Uh, I won. He won. Uh, everybody <laughs> sort of agreed that in economics, not politics, not dem though a lot of people agreed on democracy too. Lots of people thought they were going to create nice democracies, and there was a huge wave of democratization on every great era from the late 70s till the late 90s. There's no doubt about that too. But on economics and to some extent politics, America won. And the problem is uh, America didn't have a system for managing the consequences of winning. Um, and indeed, it created a system which almost guaranteed it would fail to manage it. Um, this is partly because of the trade adjustments you mentioned, but it is important to remember that in Europe, trade ratios are generally much higher the economies are on the whole more open to trade and the trade adjustments have been just as radical as in America. But by and large, and there are exceptions, Britain is more like America in this regard. They're very active labor markets. They're much greater success in building up infrastructure, in education and training has allowed many of these countries to adjust, particularly in Northern Europe, to adjust into new sectors of the economy, which has worked pretty well for them. So the extent of trauma, there's been some trauma of adjustment everywhere. Deindustrialization has been occurring everywhere. I'm going to come to that in a moment of my last sort of thought. But the, the trauma was everywhere. But the problem in America was, so they won. China and all these other countries decided, OK, we're going to go and build our industrial systems. Western con companies and even more East Asian companies, Hong Kong and so forth, all went to produce in, Ch in China and exported to the world, including very much, of course, America. And America had no system whatsoever to cope with that shock. There was no active labor market. Education was very poor. There was no active regional policy from the federal level. Basically, people were abandoned. And and that was because America had never fully, and we haven't discussed this, never fully developed the basic structure of a modern welfare state. And that left the people, when this sh shock occurred, very naked. And crucially, the trade shock we you are talking about, which is real, and the uh, was multiplied by uh, a massive combination of demand and technology, which accelerated the deindustrialization to a very high degree. Um, and that was, by and large, in the, the developed countries, the demand for manufacturers basically reached something close to satiation. So all increased demand was for services, and we shifted massively to services. And there was, in addition, very high productivity growth in the uh, uh, manufacturing sector. So um, the combination meant that we were sh we'd been shedding labor as a share of the labor force in manufacturing across the whole developed world for 40 years. So you have a trade shock combined with a demand and technology shock and in America, uniquely, absolutely no cushioning. And there was one final factor in America, I think, is the extent to which firms were financialized and the extent to which, therefore, financial factors, factors immediate profitability, com came to dominate completely the way the company saw their role. That's not true of German firms or Japanese firms or, or Swedish firms, even really quite to the same extent British firms. So once they saw, well, dumping these people in wherever it's the South, the textile was to go to China was profitable, off they went. Um, so it's this combination. So I'm putting this in a broader context. 
I think mm -hmm. it's wrong to think of this as sort of some sort of American plot against itself. Something deeper happened. America won, and it had no systems, in my view. This is only what I think now. I was very stupid about this. But they had no systems to cope with the consequences of winning, plus the um, other huge forces that were basically, and this is happening all over the world, breaking down the economic value of less skilled um, men, particularly, who had done very well in the old industrial world. And then here I'm going to make the one final point. The dominant characteristic of that old industrial world is that the old industrial countries, and there weren't many of them, really were the only people in the world who knew how to do large-scale manufacturing. They just, there wasn't anybody else who could do it. Mm. And that monopoly of know-how went, and I don't believe it could ever have been maintained. Yes, we could have made it more difficult, but in the end, the a lot of what the Chinese learned, they learned on their own. So there's been an economic revolution in the world of which, which reflected a sort of American success. And the Americans have had, I think, no idea what to do about this. And the only answer they've got, the only person who's come along and said, I have an answer, is Donald Trump. And his answer is, I'm going to stop all the imports. Well, he tried to do that and it hasn't worked. But the point is, I think the profound failure here was that, the, and this gets to the free market ideology of America, is that the, the conception of the role of government in managing profound structural changes, many of which could not, I think, have been prevented, some of which could have been ameliorated, is wrong. And worse, if things like this happen and you sort of find yourself in America, I've sort of failed. I can't support a family. I don't have a good job. The only thing you can say in America is that I'm a failure. Uh, and that's a, that's corrosive. That's poisonous. So you start blaming somebody else and you then end up in a war with China. So I I think I, I don't disagree with your story. There's a profound elite failure, but it's not just that they opened up to trade. It's something much deeper that's been going on. And I still think they haven't worked out what to do about it. No, and that's such a correct point of <clears throat> when you when you do a global arbitrage of labor, massive ex experiment almost as it were, you, you lift up so many people. And, and I've never quite thought about it the, the way you phrase it as, and that's such a great analogy actually, the US was the dog that caught, caught the car. And as we know, often when a dog catches that thing it's after, it doesn't even know what to do with it. <laughs> that's the, that's uh, the whole, the whole uh, um, the whole point, uh, I think in retrospect, they could have said, okay, we're now moving into a world in which the basic know-how of industrialization is going global. Mm -hmm. This is not just about we are importing stuff from China. China is going to export everywhere. That means so we're going to lose our foreign that. markets. We're going to even lose an hour of... Are we going to be able to stop China? I think it's very implausible. Um, so what do we need to do to preserve domestic economic stability, preserve domestic social stability, preserve, preserve political stability, and retain economic dynamism? Because otherwise, the Chinese will be all over us. That question was never really asked. And, um, and nor was it really asked in Europe. But I think it's a mistake to think you know, there's some sort of the Chinese cheated us or uh, or the um, even, you know, as I stressed, only quite a small proportion of the, I mean, exports from China were very important, but they're not all Brit American firms who've done it, nor are they all firms that dumped some production. Actually, a lot of them went to Mexico instead. That's another story. But I think the... The it is one of those stories in which America's success in convincing the world that it was the dominant model, the right economic model, broadly defined, obviously China's different, 
course. But this China is very much closer to America than Mao's China. Um, they never worked out, okay, if that's the way it's going to go, where are we going to fit in? Mm -hmm. That's the that's the question that we're walking into these next couple decades, or Absolutely. at least the the outcome of that question. Well, we'll see. I think they'll close down, but I don't think it'll work. Hmm. Well, Martin, we've used up this whole hour diving into some very fascinating topics. I certainly wish I could just keep going. Um, Thank you so much for your time and your insight. This has been extremely fascinating. It's been a great pleasure. Very interesting. Wonderful. We can do it again sometime. That sounds good. Here at The Empire's New Clothes, we believe something big is in America's future. But we don't quite know what. If you'd like to continue the journey with us, like, subscribe, and let us know who you want us to interview next in the comments below. This next decade is going to be crazy. So join us as we try to figure out what's going on, and I look forward to seeing you next week.